And Dave's called his sermon, Jesus, Servant and Shepherd. John 10, starting at verse 7. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very that? truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate, and whoever no. enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out mm -hmm. and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, so when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Now from John chapter 21, verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Then 1 Peter 5. So this was a letter that Peter, Simon Peter, wrote to the early churches. Uh, yeah, from verse 1. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. And then from Matthew chapter 20. <clears throat> and remember Matthew was also one of Jesus' disciples one of his close followers I love it how in The Chosen if you've been watching that Matthew's always there with his little notebook writing things down Jesus called them oh, from verse 25 Matthew 20 verse 25 Jesus called them together and said you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life, as a ransom for many. <coughs> Hi everyone, it's, it's great to be back. 
Good to see all your happy, smiling faces again from up here. So, um, yeah, th this week has been a, um, a, s a sad week, hasn't it, in many ways, thinking about people who have died, well-known Australian figures, Paul Green, um, if you're not a footy player, not a footy follower, he probably doesn't mean anything too, but he was quite a famous football player and coach, and then Olivia Newton-John. So there's, there's been sadness, in, but, in, but people have been special in the life of our, our country and, um, and who hold a special place, I think, in, in many people's hearts. Today, though, we're thinking a bit about leadership. And there's an anonymous writer who once said this, and you can guess who it might be about. He said this, All the armies that ever marched and all the navies that were, uh, that were ever built all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned, put together, have not affected the life of mankind on this earth as powerfully as has that one solitary life. And that, soli that one solitary life was the life of Jesus. The crazy thing is that Jesus never held any official position here on earth. He wasn't even a football coach. He wasn't um, a, a government leader. And he was also put to death as a criminal. How could someone like this have such an influence? How could he possibly be the greatest leader ever? Let's pray. Father, as we think today about leadership, particularly about your leadership, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would open our eyes to yourself and give us a fresh glimpse of the amazing leader that you are, but also the amazing God who came into this world to die for us and to rise again and to give us new life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, as we think about, we're thinking about leadership in our, in our church and appointing elders. We've been talking about that over the last uh, few weeks. And so I thought it'd be really good if we think about Jesus as our leader. We want to know what he was like. What kind of a leader was he? What were the distinctive characteristics of his leadership? We've been talking about some changes in our leadership team the last few weeks. And I thought it'd be good just to review those decisions and, and to, to sort of talk about where we're up to. So... One of, the, one of the decisions was we asked Stuart Rowe to stay on the leadership team and he was happy to do that for another six months. A second thing was we asked Calliope to be the new session clerk. A third thing was we asked Ash Davies to come back on the leadership team. He had taken leave and so he's, um, he's agreed to do that, to come back uh, from leave. And the fourth thing was we invited Di and Callie to stay on the on the leadership team and to transfer their eldership from Plumpton Presbyterian Church to Tregear Presbyterian Church. So all of these recommendations or actions were brought before the church for comments, objections, any suggestions, or any ideas at all. So everyone had the chance to, to talk about that. So we've had a few responses, uh, probably from about three or four people. And basically the, the, the common thread was that they feel it would be advisable to have a congregational vote rather than just Di and Kelly just be uh, appointed um, by, by the session and just as long as there's no objections from the congregation just to have them there. They feel it would be good to have a vote um, in, in this whole uh, business of transferring their eldership from Plumpton to Tregear. So at our meeting this week we took this suggestion on board and so we're going to, in two weeks time, we will have a vote and so um, on, on the 28th of August, uh, the vote will be by secret ballot and voting will be open to all people who are what we call communicant members of Tregear Presbyterian Church. So I thought I might just explain what a communicant member is, just so, it, so we're all clear on that. In, in the Presbyterian Church, um, a communicant member is a person who's been baptised and has made a declaration of their faith in the Lord Jesus and has also promised to serve the Lord in response to his grace. And uh, people who are communicant members, they can 
uh, join in with choosing a, a new minister and also um, with uh, voting on elders. So they also promise to support the work of the Prezi Church in Australia as they are able. And so their names get put on the what's called a communicant's role. Um, and there's also, uh, um, there are also people who are called adherents. Um, not, so the word, the, the, the adherents are people who are regular attenders at the church but for various reasons, they may have decided not to become members. Maybe they're a member of another church or, yeah, just for various reasons, they've, they've, um, they've not got their name on the communicant list. So, but adherents can't vote about the calling of a minister or about appointing elders. Now, we've updated our list of communicant members and adherents and um, we don't talk about it a whole lot, but if you're not sure which... Uh, where you fit in <laughs> and you'd like to be you know to make sure you, you know you really want to vote and you're not sure am I a communicant member or not um, did I do something way back in the past that made me a communicant member please come and, and see me afterwards and um, I, I can just check on our updated list whether you know which which list you're on and so but there's no it's not like you know one list is better than the other it's just where people are at in terms of their um, um, their, their, their position in the church. So, um, yeah, anyway, if you want to talk any more about that, we can talk about that later. So I just thought I wanted to say that because there are some people here who've only been in the church recently, and so just so you know where that, what that's all about. So we've got the next two weeks, today and next week, to consider what the Bible says about leadership. And, and uh, one of the suggestions that was made was Let's think a bit about well, what is an elder and what does leadership in the church, in the, uh, on the, the Presbyterian uh, system, is we, the leadership team is normally called a session. Um, and so how does the Presbyterian system work? And keep in mind that, um, that all that we're looking at, we want to look at what the Bible says and the Presbyterian system is very much based on the Bible, but it's not a perfect system, mainly because... Each one of us are in the system, and that, that's the main problem, um, <clears throat> like any system. So I thought it would be really helpful to look first at Jesus' leadership today and just look at wh what we learn about uh, Jesus' leadership from the Gospels. Two things I want to say initially. Firstly, as I said before, Jesus had no official leadership position in the Jewish world or in the Roman world. He didn't have any title. He wasn't even a, you know, a reverend or a um, or rabbi or anything else. And the second thing is that he says virtually nothing about how the leadership would work in the early church. Remember, he's training these disciples to go on and be witnesses for him. But he doesn't say very much about, well, actually, you know, when you set up the church, this is the kind of leadership structure you should have and, you know, you should need to have this, this, this. He doesn't say anything about that. So we're going to look a little bit at what he does say. There's a great story in, in Matthew 20, verse 20 to 28. We looked at this last year. Um, this is, these are the, where these verses that George read out come from. The two disciples, James and John, they want to make sure that when Jesus you know, gets his kingdom together, which you know, they're, they're sort of all anticipating, he keeps on talking about the kingdom. When he gets his kingdom together... Can we be, you know, one on the right-hand side and one on the left-hand side when you're sitting on your throne? We, we just thought we'd get in before the other guys might get in. And Jesus says, do you know what you're asking? <laughs> and he, he talks about how it's going to mean death for him. And are you prepared for that? But Jesus finishes off his discussion with these verses that George read out. And he says, the rulers of the Gentiles and the high officials... They lord it over others. They lord it over others. They, they use their position for their own advantage. They're, they want people to know, well, you know, who's the boss? We're the boss. We, we're the ones who are in charge. Thank you very much. <laughs> and then, then uh, here are his words for his disciples who wish to be in high positions. He goes on to say, whoever wants to become great among you must become your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. He reverses everything that we're used to, isn't he? He turns all our notions of how to be a leader 
on their head. Can you imagine in an, in an election campaign uh, Scott Morrison saying, look, Anthony Albanese is a great guy. He does some wonderful things. You know, can you see them in their, in their um, uh, debate? Listen, Anthony, you've done some terrific things. Let me just congratulate you on this, this, this. Unfortunately, I don't think it did happen. I, I might have missed that bit, but um, it doesn't happen. Can you imagine um, the, the leaders saying, look, I'm just here to serve. Well, they probably do say that, but I'm just here to serve others. That's all I want to do. Can you imagine them maybe even offering to take up their position with no pay? I really want to do this because this is what's best for our country. We just want to serve you all in the best possible way. Well, I can't imagine that, but this is what Jesus did. This is what Jesus does. He finishes his words to the disciples with, uh, by saying, For even the Son of Man, that's Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. One of the great qualities of Jesus is his servanthood. He served others. He put others before himself. You remember he washed the disciples' feet. They weren't going to wash each other's feet, no way. He gets down with the towel and the water and he washes their feet. He feeds the crowds who come to him. He heals the sick and the lame. He restores those who, who thought they were worthless. And the greatest act of servanthood, he dies on the cross for us. That was our leader, our servant leader, our servant king. Jesus defined greatness as being a servant. He humbled himself and allowed God to exalt him. He didn't have to try and grab more power or prestige for himself. So Jesus was a servant in his leadership and that's probably one of the outstanding features. Another outstanding quality of his was that he was a shepherd. Jesus valued all people. It's amazing, he, he had members of the Sanhedrin come to visit him <clears throat> in, in, and, and talk with him. He also went to their homes and had a meal with them. So they were the people who were the, I guess you could say, the top dogs. But he also ministered to the weak and the vulnerable, to the outcast, to the Samaritan woman in John 4, to the woman caught in adultery in John 7, to Bartimaeus, the blind beggar, Zacchaeus, the despised tax collector, and the list goes on and on, the widow of Nain who'd lost her only son. As a shepherd, he fed and taught the people who came to him. He was motivated by compassion. He practiced what he preached. He set his own needs aside to minister to others, not because he had to, but because his compassion made him want to. Another interesting quality of Jesus, which, um, which comes up, is that he shared responsibility and authority with those he called to lead. It's fascinating. When he sends the 12 disciples out in Luke chapter 9, he sends them out to go and preach the good news. And what he says, As you go, I'll give you the power to heal, to drive out demons and to cure diseases. He wasn't about to sort of say, Well, you know, that's, that's, my, that's my gig. You guys can just do the best you can. No, he said, No, I want you to have the same power that I have so that people will listen to the message. He wasn't, he wasn't trying to put himself up there above others. He wasn't afraid to share his authority with others. There are so many other instances we could go on because the Gospels are full of instances of, uh, of Jesus' leadership. But remember I said, Jesus doesn't give much teaching about, well, okay, disciples, this is how I want you to structure the church when I go. But there are some clues, and these passages that, um, <clears throat> that Georgina read out are, um, give, us, give us some pictures here. So after his resurrection in John 21, so looking at the John 21 passage, there's an account here of Jesus having a meal with his disciples. They're on the, on the beach, they've just caught some fish. Um, Jesus actually is cooking some fish and having some, he's got the breakfast ready, they eat it. And then Jesus pulls Peter aside and talks with him and this is the the verse 15 to 17 Jesus asks Peter three times do you love me 
Do you love me? Do you love me? And then he instructs Peter three times to feed and take care of his sheep, the ones who will be followers of Jesus. Did you notice there are only two things that Jesus does here? He says, do you love me? And he says, feed my sheep. Only two things, do you love me and feed or care for my sheep? And it strikes me that these are two principles that we would want to see in our leaders, in our leadership team, in anyone who aspires to be leaders, to love Jesus and to care for his sheep as servants. How do you care for the sheep? Well, in John chapter 10, verse 7 to 15, Jesus says, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The good shepherd knows his sheep and he lays down his life for the sheep. It's a big ask, isn't it? Who wants to be on the leadership team now? <laughs> Who wants to serve, to lay down their lives for their sheep? But that's what Jesus calls us to. Two other things that Jesus says in relation to what the early Christian leaders uh, are to do, and in fact all Christians should be doing, in Matthew 28, um, again this is um, after his resurrection, Jesus says, he sends out his disciples, go into all the world and make disciples, baptise them and teach them. Make disciples, baptise them and teach them. So there are obviously three things that are going to be important for leaders to do, but also for all Christians to be doing. And then the second thing in Acts chapter 1, Jesus says, wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you and then I want you to go out and be my witnesses to all different parts of the world. So that idea of the Holy Spirit indwelling leaders and disciples and also so that they would be his witnesses. I want to finish off by looking at Peter's words in 1 Peter 5. This is the same Peter who Jesus talked to on the beach about, do you love me? And feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And um, this is one of three key passages in the rest of the New Testament uh, where Peter and Paul talk about what, what an elder should be like. What are the qualities of an elder? So we're looking at this one today. Next week we'll look at the other two passages. And so this is what uh, Peter says. He says, To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who also will share in the glory to be revealed. What are you to be? Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. Watch over them, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you. Heard that before? not lording it over, but being examples to the flock. So this word elder is used, and it's the Greek word, I'm not a Greek scholar, but it's the Greek word presbyteros, and basically means one who is older. That's the basic meaning. It's a word that's used in various parts of the Bible. When the Old Testament was translated into Greek, they used that for, for the elders and some of the leaders. Um, so those, those 70 who helped Moses, that, word is, that, that Greek word is used for them. And for those who are on the Sanhedrin, the same word is used. And it's also used for leadership in the church. So that, that's one of the key words that's used to describe the elders or the, the leaders in the church. The other word is episkopos, which literally means one who looks over or watches over, like a shepherd. A shepherd watches over, doesn't he? Watches over the sheep. So in verse 2, um, the verb form is, so he says, be shepherds. And then he says, that's un be shepherds of God's flock that's under your care. Watching over them. And that, that word episkopos, the, the verb form, is used for, that, for those words, watch over them. I'm mentioning these words not to show my fantastic knowledge of Greek, because I had to look those up and not to have an English lesson either, but we'll be coming across them next week. So I thought it'd be helpful just to, um, to allude to them now, so you've got those two words in your mind. But for now, look at, let's look at these verses. What are the qualities of the leader in the church? They are to shepherd. Where did Peter pick that idea up from? <laughs> Back on the beach, and probably other times as well. 
Be eager to serve. That's another thing. Be eager to serve. So be a servant. And then there's this other one, not lording it over those entrusted to you. Where did Peter get that from? Back in Matthew 20. Don't, don't lord it over the others like the Gentile leaders do. And then the last one, be examples. So they're the four things that, that um, Peter pulls out here. <clears throat> These could almost be the words of Jesus, couldn't they? As one of Jesus' closest disciples, Peter heard Jesus say these words. Jesus said, feed my sheep. The exact same words that, that Jesus spoke in John 21. These are qualities we would want to see in our church leaders, in our elders. But they're qualities for all of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus. As a parent, as a leader of a church group, you know, whether it be youth group, scripture, ESL, craft group, PWA, Bible study group, home group, whatever group it might be, if you're a leader there, these are the qualities that we should see in your life. And also, really, in our workplace, in our community, these, these same qualities we should be uh, seeking to, to live out as we have opportunity. So keep looking at these passages through the week and mull over how different Jesus is as our leader. We're called to follow him. How can we serve each other? How can we serve each other? How can we be shepherds to each other? Caring for them, feeding them. What, what, what is it that we, we feed each other? How can we care for each other? So next week we'll look at the other two passages and we're also going to be considering the issue of men and women's roles in the church. That's been something which has been on the agenda in the Presbyterian Church and um, at General Assembly and so I'll make reference to that. At the end of um, our time together this morning, um, I think I, I said it in the in our um, in the letter I, in the bullet when I sent the bulletin out. I said we're going to have just an opportunity. Anyone who wants to to talk a bit more about elders and leadership in the church and the appointment of Diane Kelly or anything else to do with leadership, I'm going to be down the front here, and there's an opportunity for anyone who wants to talk about that or, or listen into a discussion about that. Just come down the front, grab a cuppa, and um, yep. Yeah, so that, that's an opportunity to, to have a bit more discussion together. But don't feel you have to come to that. If you just want to have a cuppa outside and talk to the others, that's great as well. And maybe you can care for the sheep, care for each other out there as you talk together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you for your example to us here on earth of being a servant and a shepherd leader. Holy Spirit, work in us to strengthen us to serve others and shepherd others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.